three, two, one. Smiles, everyone. Wow, what a sexy lot. Yeah. <laughs> that awkward silence while we have everybody muted and everybody's slowly pouring into the room. Hello, everyone. It's so nice to see your faces. <clears throat> As you're coming in, you'll probably notice that you are <coughs> muted, and that is how we will keep it tonight, just because it's really hard to do stuff with people off of mute with this many people in the room. Uh, but we will be taking questions, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes after everybody's finished pouring in. We need to have like pre pre patter, Jay and Al. Music. Yeah, you need to have somebody do a musical interlude as we're waiting. Yeah. Mm. Or we but can do the romper room and I see David and I see <laughs> Lyle and I see <laughs> you're you're dating yourself and I'm totally there with you. <laughs> yeah. The puppies are like, what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oops. Great. Well, it is seven thirty two and a half. Um Good evening, everybody. My name is Al Rahm. I am the chairman of San Francisco Leatherman's Discussion Group. And I want to, I want to welcome you all. Um, if you are from outside of the Bay Area, let us know where you're from in the chat. Uh, we, we are very happy that you're here and we're very happy under the circumstances to be kind of going a little broader than we are normally in our in-person, which we will get to um, once again. Uh, tonight's program is Ranch Play, the what and the why of Ranch Play. So, uh, next slide, please. Uh, Leatherman's Discussion Group was founded in 1996 to serve the educational needs of the men's kink community and all adults of all genders are welcome. We are an independent all volunteer 501c3. We are for and by the community. Uh, our programs include sexuality, health, spirituality, BDSM demos, panels, interviews, and more. Usually we meet at SF Catalyst, but we are adjusting to the shelter in place as you can, as you can understand. The board, the folks behind LDG, myself, Al. Uh, Grunt is our secretary, Rascal our treasurer. Kenny is our associate. Jay is our programming director. Jane, volunteer coordinator. Christoph is marketing and Eric does technology. But the folks that really matter are you uh, and, and your participation and your input and you're uh, just kind of coming to see what, what, what's going on. Uh, if you would like to volunteer uh, or if you just want to be involved, if you want to give us input, uh, email us at sfldg.org forward slash volunteer. Next slide. Wait, it won't move. There we go. Ah, there you go. Uh, so we're... So this year, 2021, we're celebrating our 25th anniversary. Um, it's, it's, it's really kind of amazing. It, 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 it's kind of a milestone. Uh, so what we're asking for now, if you can, you know, we wanna, we wanna get a, an event together for the end of the year and we're not sure what that's gonna look like, but we're hoping that we're gonna be able to meet in person. Um, but we'd like to get a collage of video together. And so if you have videos from uh, our fetish fair, volunteering at Folsom and Dory clothes check, our volunteer appreciation, our programs, our, you know, wherever you have photos, if you can send that to us, we'd like to, we'd like to kind of gather some, some images from the last 25 years. You can submit them to chairman at sfldg.org. Uh, we would love to, to see that and um, we will share that a, a little bit later in the year. Next slide. And tonight, uh, our 
Okay, so Mr. S has hosted us at our space at SF Catalyst and at Mr. S for a number of years, and we would like to thank them and let you know that support the, the businesses that support our community. So, you know, they're, they're still in business. We're, we're, they're all gonna, we're all gonna be back in business pretty soon. And so please just shop MrSLeather.com. There's a link there and um, we really appreciate their ongoing support. So stay connected. Okay, <laughs> stay <Sorry>. connected. <laughs> you can see the twitter.com, San Francisco LDG. Uh, you can sign up for our mail alerts at sfldg.org forward slash mail, Facebook, video, tiny URL, forward slash LDG video, and our website for updates is sfldg.org. And upcoming LDG programs, April 28th, Curated Kink, 30 Years of Preserving Our Perverted Past, with the Leather Archives and Museum. And May 26th, an evening with Patrick Mulcahy. More on that to come. And tonight, we are collecting donations for Tashra.org, the Alternative Sexualities Health Research Alliance. And their mission is improving the health and healthcare services of individuals who are involved in alternative sexualities and Richard uh, will maybe expand on that a little bit later. Okay, so last note, how to have a better meeting. No nudity. Take off your shirts. We'd love to see your tits. We, we, we love you, but this is an, an, an online, <laughs> this is an online meeting. And so we can't have like full nudity We'd love to see all your bits, um, but it's being recorded and uh, we don't want to get banned um, or, you know, you know, from Facebook or from YouTube. Uh, turn off your camera anytime you choose. Take a break anytime you choose. Uh, push the raise hand button under the participants or type questions to chat to ask questions and we will address them as they come up. All right. With that, I will turn it over to our program director, Jay. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming. <clears throat> um, couple things on uh, housekeeping. Uh, we will not be taking a break tonight, so take a break whenever you need. Um, we will go straight through. I will be uh, moderating questions in the chat. If you have questions, feel free to put them right in the chat. And um, if you'd like them to be anonymous, feel free to chat them directly to me. I am LDG programs on this, uh, on this chat. Um, and we will do, definitely do leave questions for later on in the, um, in the program as well. So we are thrilled tonight to have Richard Sprout joining us, Dr. Richard Sprout. Um, he has been in the San Francisco leather scene since 1990. Um, he started by joining the Defenders, which led him to actually us, to the Leatherman's Discussion Group. He served on our board between 1999 and 2006. And as many as you know, he now heads our LDG mentoring program. He has been on the, been all over the place in the community. He served on the Leather Organizing, on the community, Organizing Committee for SF Leather Levi Weekend. Um, from 2001 to 2006, he's held two titles in San Francisco, San Francisco Leather Daddy 23 in 2005, and Mr. Alameda County ACLC Leather in 2009. Richard is a PhD in developmental psychology and is the executive director of CARIS, the Community Ac Academic Consortium for Research on Alternative Sexualities, which promotes scientific and scholarly research on BDSM, sexuality, polyamory, and sex work. And he is the research director of our beneficiary tonight, Tashra, the Alternative Sexualities Health Research Alliance. Um, he has a constellation of a family supporting him, which includes his husband, Dave, his pumps, pup Spunky, his dog Chomper, his slave, Eric, his slave, Lyle, his slave, Jason, and his slave, number 3468. 
we are thrilled tonight to have Richard here um, to take us to school and talk about um, raunch play. So Richard, uh, welcome and Thank it's you. all you. All right. Um, in just a moment, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. While I'm doing that and kind of going through it, periodically I'll stop and ask if there are any particular questions. If you have any immediate questions, put them in the chat. And, um, and Jay is going to be uh, monitoring the chat and we'll break in if there's a particularly important question in the moment. But when we take a break uh, from me, taking a break from the slides, and ask if there are any questions, that's when we can um, just double check and catch up on things. Um, I should tell you that um, there's going to be a few pictures um, in tonight's presentation, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. And I, really, I want you to think of this as really an overview of a very large area of kink and fetish play. And so in some ways, I'm not gonna be able to do everything justice or go into exact detail um, in a lot of things, but I hope um, that you'll get some sort of um, sense of this whole area and perhaps um, raise a few questions for yourself. I'm gonna go ahead and share. Okay. Nasty, dirty sex, the what and the why of raunch play. All right. Uh, so one of the things about raunch play is that it has its own particular language and lingo. One of the words that's really important is pig or piggy sex. Um, I really like this recon add um, and it really does capture something of the spirit of this particular area of kink and fetish um, but what we're going to be doing tonight what we're going to be doing is um, i want to kind of try to describe the umbrella of ranch in um, some sort of way you probably won't be surprised uh, what's under the umbrella but um, it's often a larger range than you would expect in some ways. A little psychobiology, exactly what we know about um, how our bodies, how our brains are processing a lot of this stuff that um, will perhaps give a bit of a reason as to why a lot of people find that the uh, ranch place so attractive and uh, so erotic. We will also look a little bit more at language and terms. Um, and I will ask you um, what terms, uh, what language you use, uh, or that you have heard of or come across uh, when it comes to raunch play, uh, because this is, a, again, a huge area with quite a lot of different um, uh, developments happening in little pockets everywhere. And so uh, the language is really interesting as a window. Um, I'm going to sort of do the umbrella and talk about things in general, talk about some specific raunch scenes, uh, but I'm going to spend a little bit more time uh, looking at a special case, and this is SCAT. And that's because SCAT in many ways um, does, uh, it really captures the more extreme edge of raunch play and trying to understand it and trying to find out how many people are really into it, what are the health um, risks, et cetera, uh, related to it, I think will um, help put some of the other launch play also um, into context. Um, and there will be some pictures of scat play. Um, so you may want to avert your eyes if you're not really into this or have a, a little, you know, uh, bowl or something like that nearby where you can retch into if you really have to. But just be aware that somebody on on this uh, call, right, in this uh, presentation will probably find that really erotic. All right. 
And then we're going to talk about stigma and discrimination. Um, we're going to talk about um, the, the ways in which uh, we can kink shame each other um, around raunch play of all types. And um, I want to talk just a little bit more about that and perhaps open up a discussion um, in particular about uh, the way we can kink shame each other around some of these um, fantasies and interests. And that will close us out in terms of the presentation. I just like this picture. All right. So the umbrella of Raj. So generally there is like this, uh, there's one whole area that most of us probably think of or some sort of body emissions. Uh, so come, uh, come pig, right? Come, uh, all sorts of things, all of the different ways in which we play with come, bukake, and all this other stuff um, is really kind of raunch play. It certainly has the same spirit as some of these others. Piss, of course, is probably the next most, um, you know, common uh, interest. Uh, sweat, uh, snot or spit, scat, vomit, and smegma, right? Uh, dick cheese. Um, these are just some, but the whole idea is that somehow in some way there's uh, something being created and uh, emitted uh, by the body. Uh, and that's a big part, right, of what people think of these days when you say raunch. Closely related to that is fisting. Um, it's not exactly the same thing, but it's closely related. Uh, a lot of the same spirit is in this. Fisting, of course, can be very, mm, I guess you could say clean. Uh, fisting can also be very piggy. Um, so there is a lot of um, what I consider to be a lot of connections and some overlap even though you might find that um, some guys who are really into fisting would not consider it to be raunch play. In fact, some guys into fisting don't even consider it to be kinky, right? Or even a, a kind of a kink scene. So fisting has its own place in the constellation of all of our kinks and fetishes and alternative sexualities. Then there is this smaller, seems to be smaller to a certain extent, um, thing around messiness. Um, and this that doesn't necessarily uh, um, involve body emissions. So messy play with food, uh, mud, like the picture I showed you. Uh, and then some people really into like trash or garbage. Um, although I find that that's a little more um, esoteric, perhaps, uh, not that usual, uh, but undoubtedly people, some people are really into that kind of pigginess. So this isn't exactly exhaustive, right? There's lots of other things under the umbrella that um, can fit, but this whole thing about sort of like uh, messiness and body emissions is a pretty, pretty central to, um, uh, to what we mean by raunch play. So we're gonna talk a little bit about all of these things. Um, as I said, we're gonna um, kind of go through a slightly more extended example looking at scat later on. All right. Reblog if you like the stink of an unwashed rank jockstrap. If you do, you're a pig. Right. Um, and this actually highlights one of the central things about raunch play. And that is, it's about the sense of smell to a certain extent, closely related to it, the sense of taste. Um, so you will find that um, smells and odors and all sorts of that particular aspect is a pretty important part of raunch play. Um, getting into somebody's armpit, right? And really smelling that sweat. Um, uh, often the, it, it's, uh, you know, the 
the smell, right, of uh, uh, going into a, uh, a, trying to have sex in a public toilet, if that stuff still even happens. Um, so the idea here is that the smell is a very important part. So we need to dig a little bit into what we understand about the sense of smell. Uh, and as we know, taste is also pretty close. Both of these are like chemical senses. Uh, they, you know, these are sensory organs that detect chemicals. Uh, but we'll say a bit more about that in a moment. Uh, somewhat related to that is also the sense of touch, right? It's the texture. And this is where the messiness, like uh, messy food play or mud, uh, can really also uh, shine in terms of what is it that's really attracting people. And it's interesting because the sense of smell and the sense of, to a certain extent, taste and, and um, touch, you know, in some ways are senses that we rely on less often. Um, you know, most of our information about the world is really coming through sound, right, and vision. So hearing and seeing um, are primary ways in which we often like learn about the world. But to a certain extent, raunch play is about of really heightening and emphasizing some of these other senses um, and really allowing those to take um, sort of center stage in driving the erotic play. Um, and so the more we know about taste and smell uh, and touch, um, the more we can understand why a lot of people might be interested in raunch play. So before going into brain mechanisms, um, I just wanted to see if there are any particular questions so far about the umbrella of Ranch, at least as the way I laid it out here so far. Uh, is it possible that there's, here's some questions. Is it possible that Ranch play resembles or reminds us of some primal and primitive parts of our sexuality as well? Yes. And uh, in, in some, yes, we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Uh, right. It's definitely very primal. Um, there are also elements of it that we will see that also can take some of us really also back to a time of um, the, the way in which we experience the world um, as children. So there is a sense in, in which um, it's almost like turning back the clock before you got all, you know, civilized and socialized and proper and, you know, learned how to behave in society. And, and in a sense that there is this um, kind of similarity then between those early um, experiences of the world and the primal sort of aspects as well. So I think the two are closely related, but definitely that's part of the motivation. Okay, let's talk then a little bit about brain mechanisms. So um, talking about the sense of smell in particular, a chemical sense here, uh, we have to talk about cranial nerves zero and one. Uh, there are in fact, um, uh, 13 cranial nerves. These are uh, nerve pathways uh, that go from the body directly into the brain. So these are major highways by which sensory information comes from the body and enters the brain uh, for processing. And um, so a lot of cranial nerves then and knowing about uh, cranial nerves um, is an important way to understand a lot of kink play. In terms of the sense of smell, then uh, we're talking about cranial nerve one. This is the olfactory bulb. Of course, it's got, you know, it begins in our sinus cavity and then it goes directly uh, to um, our amygdala. 
uh, one on each side, you know, one on each half of the brain. And um, in many ways, this is considered to be, evolutionarily speaking, the oldest sense, a chemical sense, detecting chemicals in the environment so that you know whether or not something was dangerous or whether something was food. So um, this sense of smell and this sort of is in many ways very intimate because it requires actual, when you think of it as a chemical sense, it's, it requires being in direct contact with something. Right. And in the sense that odors or smells that we're emitting from our bodies um, really are chemicals, right? Some trace uh, uh, chemicals um, uh, wafting through the air, right? Or if you're getting really close and then touching. Um, and so, in some ways, you can really think of the sense of smell as re requiring this um, direct contact with what it is you're experiencing in a way that vision and hearing don't. Vision and hearing are very distant uh, senses. Uh, you can see things from far away. You can hear things from far away. You don't have to be in contact. But smell and taste, you have to be in contact. So there's something about that, I think, that we can think of uh, and maybe one of the reasons why um, not only did it evolve first, but that it has a very different kind of experience for us as we interact with the world. So this, these projections go from our sinus cavity, right, directly into our, our amygdalas, which um, tend to really um, be the first stop in processing and uh, sort of uh, creating, managing uh, sexual arousal, um, lust, anger and fear. And in as much as lust, anger, and fear are pretty central to an organism's survival, an animal's survival, the survival of the species, um, it's interesting to note that this direct pathway, this direct connection with someone else um, through their, you know, odors, um, can uh, sometimes very unconsciously, right, change our levels of anger or fear or lust. Um, cranial nerve zero, on the other hand, is different and distinct anatomically and functionally. It's the pheromone uh, nerve, and pheromones are chemical signals that we emit that um, are very important in particular for sex and for lust and for um, uh, sexual intimacy and connection and bonding. And so uh, cranial nerve zero follows essentially the same sort of pathways. It's got projections in the sinus cavities. It goes directly to the amygdala. It's probably part of um, the whole processing of getting you know, aroused and turned on by the scent or the smell of someone else. Now, it's also important to note that when it picks up a pheromone, that is not the same thing as a smell perception. There is no smell part with pheromones. It is a separate and distinct chemical communication pathway. So, um, in particular, pheromones um, often are exuded through sweat, uh, specifically. Uh, there are trace amounts in some other body emissions, but generally it is through sweat that you're likely to get uh, large enough amounts of pheromones uh, for other people to pick up. So that sense of smell, the perception of it, the first thing is, um, it sounds as if it's pretty simple. There's a chemical, there's a chemical in the air, there's a chemical in the, you know, sort of a scent or some sort of a, a chemical in the skin, in the sweat, whatever. And your nose is just picking up that chemical and detecting, oh, it's that particular chemical. Uh, and, and that's what smell is. Well, Actually, 
uh, as with many of our other senses. Um, in fact, that's way too simple a story of what's going on with the sense of smell. Um, like a lot of our other senses, the sense of smell is actually a combination of not just the chemical you detect, but um, it's affected by, and it is a, it's sort of made up of, different uh, aspects of the context at the moment. Um, so what we find here is that culture and our cultural history and our cultural training as we're growing up can really um, affect the way we perceive a smell. And in particular, the emotional tone, right? That comes with our reaction to particular odors. So the emotional tone of the situation can also greatly affect how something smells to you. Um, so these emo the emotional context, the cultural associations that we have, you know, from our upbringing, from our um, uh, cultural history, uh, can all basically shift um, how we experience the smell. So this is why um, a smell, an odor, a scent from someone you lust after or someone you love is experienced very differently than essentially the same chemical from a stranger. Um, or if you were, you know, with someone who you love or lust for, and you're in a less intimate setting, your experience of that odor, that scent, that smell is going to be uh, different than if you're in an, a place where you're feeling some sort of arousal. So it's important then to recognize that um, whether or not you like a certain smell depends a lot on not just the chemical that's uh, being detected, but all of these other factors and that in fact, emotion is a very important part of smell which means of course that emotion is a very important part of raunch play. Um, here's a quote from a quick article, context is key to olfaction in science uh, from last year, I think it was. Um, oh no, yeah, 2020. Perfumes often contain fecal tones that combine with the wearer's natural scent to evoke an earthy intimacy that in fact, a lot of perfumes have trace elements of stuff that smells like shit. And that's what actually in combination with someone's uh, other scents and odors um, actually creates a, a, an enticing and arousing uh, sense of experience of smell. Um, if you don't have those fecal tones in it, that sort of earthy aspect to it, um, it can come across as, you know, very um, uh, uh, clean in the sense of like, you know, a lot of like lemony sort of stuff can create this sense of, um, uh, especially in our culture, because you know, we have so much association with lemon as being clean. Uh, that you get uh, a very different experience uh, and perhaps not as attractive when you're trying to attract someone else with the scent. Uh, so that's cranial nerves one and zero, um, the sense of smell. Uh, there's a couple of other than uh, neurotransmitters and hormones that are important that are also directly connected to the sense of uh, smell. Oxytocin and vasopressin, these are hormones related to the glow that we get from orgasm. And in fact, um, a lot of nerves, a lot of neurons in our brain um, have a lot of receptors for these particular hormones and uh, neurotransmitters. And generally, these are in parts of our brain that are important for bonding for emotional um, bonding uh, with someone else. And these are also found in important areas of the brain that are 
uh, critical for um, the relaxation response for coping with stress. So this glow aspect to an orgasm, this bonding, this um, relaxation response, um, all is um, often mediated by these um, particular neurotransmitters. And why that's important is that these are dense, these receptors for these hormones are densely present in the olfactory system. Uh, that the sense of smell is incredibly important then for bonding, for emotional connection, uh, but also actually, as it turns out, for social aggression um, as well. Because again, that fear and anger parts um, are processed in you know, very close, uh, uh, closely connected to the area of uh, sexual arousal or lust. So um, that means, again, that a lot of people are going to be attracted to raunch because it's hitting you in exactly this sweet spot of, you know, your um, olfactory bulb, uh, your cranial nerve one. Um, it's really hitting you with your with oxytocin and vasopressin, which um, really have these sort of like um, glow aspects to them. So um, it's not um, a surprise that a lot of people would find, in essence, that their body really responds to raunch play. I do want to also point out one other thing, uh, a specific area of raunch is vomit. Um, actually, a ton of vasopressin is also released during vomiting uh, and can kick off quite a lot of these other associations then. So um, that one in particular, right, um, also is implicated with uh, these pathways. Any questions at that point? If I can answer them. Nothing coming up really Good. for this right now. So. All right, so the big point I want to get across is you know, in many ways, our bodies are ready for this, right? Our bodies are absolutely prepared for getting um, quite an arousal response uh, because of raunch. All right, uh, let's go into language. Again, uh, looking at language and, and culture as a window into what people are thinking and feeling and what they're find important. So the word raunchy actually was uh, is, is something that um, was used in the 1930s, 1937 is the earliest we can find it in writing. Um, and it was this, used primarily as a slang for sloppy or messy and primarily I believe um, was very popular in the army uh, as a way to talk about something sloppy and messy. And it wasn't until later, like the 1960s or so, when raunchy started to mean sexual stuff. Before that, it didn't mean sexual stuff. It just meant messy or sloppy. Um, but it started to get uh, extending towards um, different kinds of erotic contexts. Of course, pig or piggy sex or the whole range of pig related uh, language um, is a pretty important for trying to communicate some aspects of interest in raunch or the kind of sex that would be, you know, recognized as raunch play. Uh, wham or wet and messy uh, generally is much more about food or mud or things like that rather than body emissions. Sploshing is, of course, the messy food play. Um, people feeling, uh, often there's an element of, uh, again, the sense of touch that's really important in sploshing, how it feels. I don't think I need to explain water sports to this crowd um, or golden showers or a golden bath or other things like that, but you can imagine, right? In fact, I would invite you in the chat to start putting all sorts of terms that you know for raunch play 
uh, for all different kinds of activities in the ranch play. And I would imagine that we'll have a long list. Ah, uh, I do see a question about whether or not pooping releases vasopressin. And I don't know the answer to that. I'm going to see if I can find out. I don't know that anybody's done any study about that. I can imagine if it's a big exertion, it might. I don't know. All right. So how many people are really into this? So I'm looking at three, what I consider to be core piggy activities, poor, core raunch activities, which is piss, fisting, and scat. And we asked about those three things in particular on the Tashra did on the kink health survey that we conducted in 2016. Uh, when we conducted it, uh, we kept the survey open for about six months and we got um, roughly about 1,300 people to um, uh, fill it out, at least, you know, to fill out parts of it. And um, so this is looking at just how many people do this. And there's a couple of things to note. Um, first off, fisting and piss are pretty popular, common, um, definitely more than 40% up to just over 52, almost 52%, um, have done of kinky people in general, right. Have done piss play or fisting. Uh, and the fisting of course includes both anal fisting, but also vaginal fisting. Uh, when we asked about scat, um, the numbers you see here are pretty what a lot of people have found in a lot of other um, surveys of kink behaviors, asking people what it is exactly they do. And the numbers tend to be roughly in this area where scat is actually pretty rare. Um, about three and a half, you know, three, three and a half percent of people have done scat. It's interesting to note though, that gay men are much more likely to have done scat than other um, gender sexual orientation groups in the King community. I have no idea why. I have some conjectures and hypotheses, but I think it is important to note that there is the sense in which gay men are, might be more likely to engage in it than other kinky people, even though that number is still very, very low. Um, other set, as I said, other studies have found pretty similar uh, results when asking what, what people are doing. Um, so this is where we're gonna kind of switch over and go into a bit more depth uh, about a particular example, and that's uh, SCAT. Um, again, this is much more of the extreme edge play aspect of Ranch. And even within that edge play aspect, there's quite a range of ways in which people do SCAT. And as I said before, um, there will be a few pictures um, of SCAT play as we go along. So just put on your curiosity hat don't get too disgusted. All right. All right. So in particular, I've been always astonished at how the language around shit play um, or around scat play. Um, there's quite a lot of things and you can, um, in some ways, um, I, I, I think that there's um, this huge um, range of ways of talking about it because in many ways it's so hidden and so rare that it's easy for different small pockets of community to come up with their own language or their own terms or for the porn in this area to invent its own vocabulary. Um, so a number of these are also kind of medicalized, um, right? Coprophilia, coprophagia are very medicalized terms. Um, the 
Uh, oh, yes, somebody said the rusty nail. Yes, I forgot it. I should put that on here. Um, so you can see there's lots of euphemisms, right? Different ways of talking about it without necessarily being very blunt or direct. Uh, again, as uh, people try to handle the stigma, in fact, or around this stuff, or they um, how completely outside of civilized behavior this is. Um, and people are giving me even more. So thank you in the chat. So when we think about scat play, what we can see is that um, there is a huge range of activities. So some people just are into like the smearing of it. Um, and often this is about the sense of smell, but also the sense of touch. How does it feel? Uh, so painting uh, with shit, rubbing it around. Um, uh, often, you you know, I did not include pictures here of extreme smearing, uh, but you can imagine um, that people um, can really get into this. And for some people, this is all they do, right? Um, it's that is that is the release. That is the the focus of their um, scat play is just smearing and not really doing anything else. Of course, there's shit kissing and shit fucking and shit fisting. Um, these things are, of course, the kissing, fucking, and fisting that we all know, except now there's the presence of, of scat in, um, in the activities. Of course, feeding. There's also packing, which is pushing shit back into an asshole, your own or somebody else's and then often pushing it back out again. So back and forth, or sometimes just holding it. Or, uh, and then the more extreme form is farming, uh, which is looking at, looking for other people's shit, uh, stranger shit, um, just to look at, uh, and for some people to actually play with. So there's quite a lot of things people can do with um, scat. And what's interesting is that people who are doing this uh, we'll do some of these, but not others. Uh, we'll be open to some activities um, and definitely absolutely refuse to do any others. Uh, and then of course, some people over time continue to explore as their um, uh, scat fetish grows and changes. So, this is the more ingesting form. Let's talk about the psychological motivations. Um, there hasn't been a lot of work done in this. There's been some, um, and I bet we can probably imagine that some of the ideas we have about why am I into this or why is he into this uh, can probably fit in one of these um, categories. One is uh, intimacy. Often, especially with scat, but it, it applies to piss. It applies to uh, probably piss in particular, the, the toilet sort of activities. And that is, you know, often you're not supposed to do this in front of other people. You're not supposed to do this with other people in the room. Um, and so in a sense, uh, doing this with someone else close by or someone um, in intimate contact with you um, increases the sense of intimacy, your sense of connection to the other person. You are actually taking a part of them, whether it's spit or sweat or, or shit, uh, you're taking a part of them into yourself. And it's like, you can't get closer contact than that. Um, and so for a lot of people, this kind of play, ranch play can be about this kind of intimacy, especially I would say um, the body emissions, right? Kind of uh, uh, play, including scat. So some people find that it's a very intimate act that that's actually what is erotic about it. 
is the sense of closeness and connection that you just normally would not get in any other situation or with any other person. Uh, completely opposite of that is degradation and humiliation. Some people like piss or scat play or getting spit on and all this other stuff because it's part of the humiliation and degradation. And, um, you know, I've done for LDG a humiliation play uh, presentation, which goes into a bit more as to why uh, humiliation is also erotic, but definitely raunch play can be used in the service of some sort of humiliation and degradation play. Um, and so that's often a very powerful um, power trip and um, includes um, quite a lot of this um, very, uh, you know, I would say edgy sort of emotional play as well. Challenge. So for some people, uh, scat play in particular can be about, uh, this is very difficult to do, your body or your, you know, your psychological uh, upbringing has taught you that this is absolutely dirty and disgusting. And so in some ways, the challenge part is, can you do this? Can you push yourself to do this? Um, sometimes it is, you know, can you do it in order to show somebody else uh, how much you're willing to submit or how much um, you want to please them? Um, so the challenge part sometimes is about um, the person really like, can I actually do this? And I want to try. I want to see if I can, in essence, achieve this. Um, and that's sometimes a bit more about, um, you know, um, trying to uh, live up to something, right? Um, some sort of goal or some sort of um, value that you have for yourself and you want to challenge yourself. And that's some aspect often for some people when it comes to um, scat play. Of course, there's a really big element of submission and service. So again, about power. Um, whereas intimacy and challenge are not so much focused on power and power exchange, uh, degradation and humiliation and service and submission as motivations for doing scat play, for doing um, piss play or whatever, um, can be about that. And again, this would probably apply to all forms of raunch play, really. But this level of service and submission, it's a very distinct and different headspace, right, than perhaps some of these others. But um, it can be a very powerful motivation for actually engaging in scat play. Uh, kind of similar to challenge is taboo breaking, except challenge is about challenging yourself, right? It's about, can I do this? Can I achieve this? Can I force myself? to do this. Taboo breaking really is about um, other people's rules, society's uh, laws and rules and um, what's considered appropriate and breaking those, right? And there's a kind of release that can happen or people can feel in essence more primal uh, because they're breaking a taboo, a socially set kind of rule, a line or boundary and um, doing something that is in essence, uh, you know, uh, really not allowed, right? And so there is a kind of emotional release, a kind of um, a physiological response that our bodies experience when we break taboos. And so for some people, I mean, there are so many taboos, right? Around raunch play that um, breaking them can in and of itself be a source of, um, of a, like a peak experience or an erotic high. 
similar to this, but not exactly the same, is releasing inhibitions. So as we become civilized and socialized and, you know, we learn to behave in ways that are um, acceptable and allow us to walk through our culture and our society, um, we often have to inhibit quite a lot of behaviors. In fact, the whole thing about potty training, right, or toilet training is controlling yourself, inhibiting uh, a sort of a, I guess you, what you could say, a, a untrained, right, sort of reaction. So when you start doing raunch play, in order to do it, you really have to release a lot of inhibitions, uh, inhibitions that you put on yourself, inhibitions that other people have drilled into you. And this releasing of inhibitions uh, can be experienced as um, um, a, a stress reliever, as um, uh, one theory in particular about uh, masochism, and I think it applies to ranch play, um, although the original author did not talk about ranch play. Um, but this whole idea of escape from self and what he meant by escape from self is that often this kind of play masochism kink fetish um, can be about um, putting down the burden right of adulting right putting down the burden of of having to be the good and right and proper boy right um, and so uh, I think to a certain extent, this uh, ability, right, then to release these inhibitions uh, becomes part of the psychological journey and struggle of ranch play and often becomes an important point where people can really allow themselves to let go, right, and to let go about specific things um, that have to do with duty and responsibility and propriety. Um, and that can get us into a place that's more rejuvenating or energizing. All right. So those are some psychological motivations for scat play. Uh, there's been, uh, I'm sure that's just scratching the surface of why people do it. But I think that most people will recognize that some of those motivations are uh, going on. In particular about scat, I've already said that it's a relatively rare form of raunch play. Um, um, as we found out from the 2016 King Health survey. But there's a couple of other things to note um, about it. Um, so one of the things I do is I keep, so every once in a while I look in on Scat Boy um, and they have, it's a particular website, right? Um, it's kind of Fet Life for Scat. Um, and it has grown a lot. Um, in February, 2007, there were about 10,000 profiles on it. Um, by 2012, you know, um, really just about five, six years later, it had uh, increased to 31,000 profiles. Um, four years later, it had a 33% increase and now had 41,000 profiles. And when I checked it last, well, a year and a half ago, almost two years ago, oh, that's right two years ago, um, it had uh, continued to grow with almost 50,000. And of course, this is primarily gay men. I mean, it's like 99% gay men, uh, gay bisexual men. And then when I did take a quick look last month, um, uh, it had grown still since uh, uh, two years earlier, a 5% increase, but overall, uh, what we also see is the age range has um, sort of um, includes people from 18 to 92, this particular point. 
So the point is like, this is a very niche sort of um, website that caters to this particular scene. It's not the only one, but um, it's uh, one that um, is particular to gay men. And uh, it has increased quite a lot. Now, of course, there's a lot of noise in this, right? People maybe doing multiple profiles or whatever, people putting the profile in and then never coming back. I mean, so there's a tremendous amount of noise in this. I wouldn't bet on this, except the overall picture is that this is a kink that has grown in popularity to a certain extent, uh, even though it's still very, you know, uh, taboo and very low in terms of how many people. That life has um, 485 groups that have toilet in the name. The largest group uh, has over 12,000 members and 1,313 members have toilet in the handle or name of their profile. 3,334 members have scat in the handle or name. So again, um, it, this, if there's anybody out there who's thinking like, oh my gosh, nobody's really into this. I better not talk about it and all this other stuff. Well, that's, I mean, again, it's still rare-ish, but um, there's a fair number of people who are interested in this particular kind of raunch play. Then if you add in all the others, right, you can see that this might be a fairly large portion um, of people in the community. So let's talk about health in particular with SCAD. Because this, of course, is the thing that everybody uh, worries about, that everybody projects about, that everybody is concerned about. Um, and, uh, and to a certain extent, I think that there's a, a reason to be conscious of the health risks involved. There's a fair number of things you can get doing SCAD play. Um, even some of these even, you know, um, can happen whether you're just smearing. Of course, if you're just like looking um, and not really touching, uh, then the risk of this stuff goes down quite a bit. But crypto, Giardia, Shigella, hepatitis A, E, uh, viruses that cause inflammation in the digestive system, if you get it in your mouth or you eat it, E. coli, polio, and tapeworms. So you would think this would be enough, right? To put anybody and everybody off. Um, it is, um, a, it's one of the reasons why it's an edge play. It's, it can be pretty risky. Um, on the other hand, it's interesting to note that um, the medical um, profession is starting to recognize the health benefits of feces. So there's uh, there is a thing called fecal bacteriotherapy uh, or stool transplant, where pe um, people with healthy digestive systems, their shit is basically taken and put into the body of someone whose digestive system is really uh, not working well, uh, who is having quite a lot of like irritable bowel syndrome. This has actually also been used for Parkinson's or other autoimmune diseases um, and found to be of benefit. And this again is part of the overall picture of, of the uh, medical science uh, really paying attention to and discovering the microbiome, right? All of the other, you know, bacteria and viruses and all the other stuff that actually help our bodies to function. And um, so in essence, that's what's happening when you transplant somebody's stool from one person to the next, you're um, affecting their microbiome. Um, uh, so there's a, a number of other health conditions uh, CDI, um, which has been used, right, 
uh, this particular kind of thing. So people recognizing that health is not just, I mean, shit is not just bad, right? Um, so in fact, since 2012, MIT has started a stool bank. So they just keep different samples of People bottle up their shit and send it to MIT. So, you know, I don't know. Uh, it seems to me like this is a kind of um, aspect which um, counteracts this whole, whole narrative that shit is always bad, that we get um, trained into. So there is this other aspect to it. And I'm not quite yet ready to say, and this is also happening when people are doing scat play. Maybe, I'm not sure. Oh. Now, this is very informal. And when I have talked to people who are doing a lot of scat play, uh, they have told me that roughly, I've talked to a number of people, roughly about 10% of the time, if they're eating shit, um, they will have some sort of distress uh, even from a healthy feeder where like none of those diseases or organisms or anything else like that are happening, even if the um, feeder is like totally healthy and everything is fine, still about one out of 10 times, uh, the person might get a fair amount of intestinal or digestive distress um, as in essence, what's happening is the microbiomes, so your own microbiome and then the microbiology of the um, scat um, is sort of in conflict. So even at the best of times and all the healthiest situation, um, you still might have this as a, a after effect. Um, a lot of experienced people who are experienced in um, eating scat uh, often say don't eat on a completely empty stomach. Uh, again, this, I think, has something to do with um, just getting the body somewhat ready to handle, right, uh, an influx of, um, of a different bio, right, microbiome. But it means that even in the best of situations, there still might be some difficulties. And this is one of the situations that might result in one of those difficulties. Okay. Let me just see if there are any questions at this point. Some good comments, some good health information is being shared um, in the chat. I really appreciate that, thank you. All right, so we're still sort of focused on scat. Isn't it a sign of a mental disorder, right? Often scat and playing with scat, and this includes mostly spearing, uh, smearing and eating one's own shit generally is what this is discussed if you look at the mental health um, psychopathology literature. And not surprisingly, people um, who are having a really bad bout of a schizophrenic break or psychosis um, or even dementia, um, all of these um, people um, dealing actively with these particular conditions, um, SCAT, right? Uh, has been uh, uh, implicated in how their mental, mental disorder is expressed. Um, other people have talked about, well, you know, scat play in particular is very, um, you know, this is more the psychodynamic, psychoanalytic literature. It, it's, it suggests more of the narcissistic tendencies because in essence, you're playing with something that your own body created, right? You're playing with something that came from you. And so therefore, you're just all wrapped up in yourself kind of thing is, I'm simplifying it to a certain extent, but 
um, the idea is that these narcissistic tendencies, um, which are, you know, generally those kinds of tendencies are really healthy when you're an infant or when you're a young child. So again, there's this idea that scat play kind of signals um, a more id-like rather than ego and superego, right? It's more the sort of primal, as someone said earlier, uh, more of the animalistic, uh, more of the uncivilized part of our psyche. And, um, and narcissism is a big part of that as well. Um, the id, uh, you know, according to Freud and, and a lot of psychoanalysts, the id, that, that part of us, which is uncivilized and um, not a, um, a product of culture or anything like that, that part of us um, is really important because it's the wellspring of our energy, right? It is, it is the uh, passion uh, that um, makes life um, really interesting and worth living. Um, but on the other hand, it is also um, pretty not particularly focused on other people, uh, but on the self. So it does seem to suggest a kind of uh, more offense considered to be sort of uh, in a pathologizing way, uh, more of a um, sort of childish, childlike, uh, not a grown up. If you're really into this, there must be something, some sort of arrested development, right? It's, uh, something wrong, something out of balance. Um, the other aspect in the psychopathology literature when it comes to SCAT is um, that it's actually a major focus. SCAT is a major focus for obsessive compulsive disorders, you know, getting contaminated, dirty, um, trying to clean up. And in fact, um, not that there's been a study done yet, but it has been noted uh, anecdotally by a lot of people, and I have seen this to a certain extent, and that is um, often people really into scat are also at the same time very clean and fastidious and conscientious in other areas of their life, right? Their room is absolutely immaculate, uh, but then they have this one part of their sex life that where they just let everything go. And um, so that dichotomy between being very, very orderly, very clean, and then very messy um, can in essence um, sort of be the way in which somebody who has slight obsessive compulsive tendencies or a full blown obsessive compulsive disorder might actually still be um, so in, uh, enraptured by um, scat. So, I mean, this is sort of this idea that somehow in some way it is a mental disorder. This is the one thing about the whole stigma, as we'll get to, is that um, in many different parts of the culture, um, a lot of this um, psychiatric and medical um, ideas have sort of permeated uh, the culture. And so it's not unusual, right, to think that somebody thinks you must be crazy to do this sort of raunch play. Uh, Freud wrote an essay in 1908, Character and Anal Eroticism. Uh, where he proposed, right, that early in infancy, or early in childhood, again, like right around the time your toilet training and all this other stuff, that um, taking a shit and feeling sexual are actually not distinct feelings, uh, not to the developing mind, not to the infant or the very, very young child. It's only later that, um, that you know, elimination, right, pissing and shitting, um, is become separate from sexual feelings. And in fact, um, in some ways that's kind of trained into us to separate out um, our toilet activities and um, our sexual activities. Uh, but early on in life, these are 
I won't say fused, but they flow back and forth much more easily, uh, much more likely. And so in some ways then people getting into this kind of raunch scene are recovering in essence that sort of original experience of excremental and sexual interests being sort of blended. Um, so our natural, according to Freud, uh, like, you know, our, our natural liking and pleasure from shit gets transformed into orderliness, parsimony, and obstinance, right? Um, through the course, right, of psychological development um, in early childhood. So this is part of where we get a lot of these ideas that in fact, the uh, breaking taboos or releasing inhibitions um, has this uh, sort of aspect of going back to an earlier time in our lives when these things were not separated, right? Um, not Freud, but Jung uh, noted also that um, if you go through uh, many, many myths and legends and stories uh, and folk tales um, across many, many different cultures, you will find this really strange connection between money and gold and shit. Um, that somehow in some way one gets transformed into the other. Um, and often uh, Jung's analysis was that um, this weird way in which we connect the most valuable thing, right? Gold, uh, money, uh, to the least valuable thing, right? Our waste um, somehow allows for a very uh, complicated but interesting and powerful um, way of coping, right? With um, stress and um, understanding, um, trying to understand the world. So um, the fact that very valuable things often get connected to very, um, the least valuable thing, uh, scat, means that it has this kind of pull and power to it that uh, you normally wouldn't expect. All right, so that's enough about scat. Let's talk about the Ranch Play umbrella. So messy play in particular, in addition to the motivations I was talking about for scat, I think they apply to all sorts of raunch play, right? Uh, spit and piss and, and, but when we get to more of the messy play stuff, the food and the mud and all of that other stuff, there seems to be a slightly different psychological profile for that, I think. Um, so definitely the sensory experience, the touch in particular um, is really important um, for like mud play or splashing or messy food play. Um, and in particular, this like going for the sensory experience, how it feels, right? The sensuousness of having that messy stuff all over your skin. Um, can be, in essence, I mean, it really is the definition of a fetish. So um, that's a good point, David. <laughs> I just read that in the chat. Um, there might be all sorts of associations. Um, one of the things about messy play that's interesting is that it may have special appeal to people who have sensory processing disorders, that is some sort of difficulty with, with the way in which they're processing the sense of touch or maybe the sense of smell and taste, but definitely touch. Um, and people who have a sensory processing difference or a sensory processing disorder, uh, that's a separate thing, but often it coincides in the same person who has um, is on the autism spectrum. Um, so, but there are people who have sensory processing dis differences or disorders who are not autistic or on the spectrum. 
but um, a lot of people on the spectrum do. And so it can be the sense in which uh, these different kinds of ways of processing sensory information uh, can lead people to really be attracted to and get really aroused by uh, messy play. So I think it needs to be tested. There does seem to be a lot of anecdotal evidence to support something like that. Um, I don't know that there's been a lot of research in that. Of course, messy play uh, is about breaking taboos, some sort of transgression, right? You can imagine the, again, the infant throwing their food all around, putting it all over their face. Um, it has the same sort of like feel in terms of how a scat play or other aspects of ranch play really work. So that's why I'm not necessarily surprised that while in some ways it's very distinct from the whole collection of body emission ranch play, um, it still has so much in common, so many things that are similar that um, you really do want to keep it um, under the umbrella. And as has already been mentioned a number of times, there's a very messy play in particular, right? Walling around in the mud pit, um, messing around, like getting food all over your face and all over the table and all over the place is a very animalistic experience. Right. So getting in touch with that is a way of getting in touch with where we get a lot of our energy, right? A lot of the passion and a lot of the um, um, real power, right, of, of our experience is found in these particular areas of our person, right? Our areas of our mind. So messy play is a way to get there is a way to really uh, touch that and attract that. Um, and und undoubtedly, right, there are ways in which all of this stuff can be uh, combined and um, people can get messy in all sorts of ways. Um, I do wanna say the last motivation that's really important, especially around messy play, but probably around the body emissions raunch play is fun. Um, fun as its own motivation, right? I mean, you don't have to explain anything other than it's fun. Um, so pleasure or fun is an end in and of itself. It is um, the experience and also the reason, the motivation. So um, often we tend to, especially in a very sort of work focused and Puritan kind of culture that we live in, uh, we often denigrate fun and pleasure. And um, I just wanna hold it up as a motivation in and of itself that doesn't need any further explanation. Sometimes it's just fun. I'm not sure what's gonna happen next here, but I think this is enema play. Just a few words then about some of the other core uh, health stuff with the um, core areas of raunch play. So sometimes you'll hear a lot of people say, and frankly, I've been known to say this myself um, in the past, um, that a piss is sterile. That's why you don't have to worry about it. It's not as bad as shit. Um, so, but it is important to actually recognize that piss has trace amounts of bacteria often actually, you know, things, bacteria living in your urethra, uh, not in your bladder necessarily, unless, you know, something's going on. So um, it has trace amounts of that stuff, but really not a lot. So there really isn't um, a ton of things like you would find, for example, in something like scat. Um, you know, sweat, I, th I think is probably essentially the same kind of thing. Um, however, when it comes to piss, gonorrhea is an issue. Um, and uh, one of these bacteria kind of situations that you do have to be careful of. So if somebody has an active case of gonorrhea and they're dripping, right, the clap, um, 
uh, you can, of course, easily catch it uh, by having someone piss on your face or piss in your mouth. Um, so gonorrhea is something to really pay attention to. Um, but really, in some ways, the health issue around piss is the presence of drugs, right? Your body is processing drugs. These are recreational drugs. These are medical, you know, medicines. Um, all sorts of drugs, right, are being processed by our bodies and uh, filtered out by our kidneys. And, um, and this can get, right, passed on through piss. So um, there have been a fair number of stories of people uh, who've been known to test positive for drugs at work the next day because they drank a pretty good amount of piss the night before. And that person who was feeding them piss um, actually was indulging, right, in uh, some sort of recreational drug. So, um, so that's probably, I, I would say, probably the, the more Im likely immediate concern is having medications and drugs uh, sort of passing through, um, uh, th passing through piss. And again, uh, much like with a lot of these other raunch plays, there are ways to do it where it's safer if you don't ingest. Um, but of course, a lot of people want to and still do. But to be aware of that, and the practice, you know, sort of harm reduction. Uh, fisting, uh, that's its own, gosh, you know, LDG has done uh, fisting uh, uh, workshops and educational events. Uh, so I don't think I feel I really have to go through this, but it should be mentioned, uh, right? HIV, Hep C, STI infections are transmitted and can be transmitted uh, when you're putting your hand inside somebody else's rectum. Uh, tears or fistulas can also be an issue. Um, most situations tend to be related to um, not enough lube is actually a culprit in many of these cases or people who are being just very aggressive uh, and not being careful. Um, did also think when it comes to piggy sex and raunch play that we should talk or at least mention chem sex, and I'm not uh, an expert necessarily on this. I do have colleagues um, who have done a lot of work in this area, but it's important to, for us in this conversation about raunch play uh, to recognize that there is a certain segment of the gay men's community, which includes kinky gay men, but not just kinky men, uh, but where chem sex is actually um, uh, strongly connected to piggy sex, right, to raunch play. Uh, and there's a whole host of, of psychological reasons why um, people make this connection, people um, then find themselves using, right, um, recreational drugs in order to get to that place of releasing inhibitions or breaking taboos and uh, find that that's that assists them in doing that. Um, and often it, that kind of releasing of inhibitions and breaking taboos and all that stuff can lead to, right? A lot of uh, interest and desire and lust for um, raunch play and piggy sex. So there's a lot more here that uh, can be um, said and worked out, but it should be mentioned tonight. Um, so in particular in injuries, when it comes to consensual uh, fisting, um, there was this one study published a few years ago that looked at um, a systematic review of all of the, um, and these are all sort of medical reports and um, uh, these are all situations where the injury required medical intervention or medical care. And what they found was that um, that in 56% of the cases of people being injured during fisting, uh, some sort of drugs or alcohol was involved, right? So again, playing while you're playing, you know, um, uh, 
plane while you party, sorry, that's the thing, um, is um, actually a, a fairly large risk factor for when it comes to different kinds of injuries. Um, over half, not all, but over half, um, some sort of intoxication was part of the picture. Ah, I have no idea what that substance is. I'm guessing it's mud, right? All right, actually, let me see if there are any particular questions at this point before we get into this last part, the stigma. Lots of really good sharing in the chat. Not any specific questions right now. Okay, that's great. I'm really, when I get a chance and look over at the chat, I think people yeah. are sharing a lot of really good things. Uh, asparagus pea. <laughs> Yeah, if you if you really want that challenge aspect. <laughs> All right, let's talk about the stigma part. Um, these are negative reactions. So, you know, a few days ago, I asked, uh, I posted on the LDG Facebook page, just, hey, would somebody be willing to share um, any kind of negative reaction that they've had when someone found out they were into one of these, you know, raunch play scenes? Um, uh, and here are some of the reactions uh, and some of the things, some are summarized and some I've quoted. Um, but I've heard of this one um, even before, right, this last week. People who go out of their way to tell you that they don't do raunch play. Like you've posted it or included it in your profile. You said something right about this or about, you know, uh, raunchy, uh, uh, raunchy jocks or something like that. And um, it's it's odd in some ways that people will go out of their way to contact you to tell you that they're not into it. You know, let alone everything else that you put on your profile or anything else where they could connect with you, um, that's what they focus on. And, you know, it sort of comes across as kind of trying to shame you, but at the same time trying to uh, shore up their own good self. Um, but still, it puts right the person who receives this kind of message, who has said, you know, I'm into ranch play, into a really awkward position. And often very odd as to why is this person saying this? I'm not sure what message I'm supposed to get. Um, so um, a lot of people, I think, uh, feel like they have to somehow in some way defend themselves or uh, shame you and and when you mention this by doing this kind of strange right negative reaction um, so this was a particular quote I thought was um, uh, captured quite a lot of the aspects of stigma so somebody on a gay hookup site said they were into fisting and someone contacted them and said dude who raped you as a child what possessed you to get into fisting? It's filthy and disgusting and you should be ashamed of yourself. Fuck you, freak. You're a disgusting faggot and you need to know that. And again, um, I got a number of reports and people saying that they had this kind of reaction or they know someone who had this kind of, who received this kind of reaction uh, generally on on you know sites that are not kinky, right? That are not marked for uh, being kink friendly or something like that. So um, it's more likely to happen there, but I don't know that it, um, it you know it still happens even uh, on kink sites too. Hopefully to a lesser degree. Um, serious reaction of you gross no when discussing with a partner about a smegma fetish, right? So again, now disclosing this to someone 
uh, who you're closer to. You're not just someone you're trying to hook up with. And um, that kind of reaction, um, that kind of negative reaction from partners is particularly woundy in some ways. Uh, this is a person who, you know, is supposed to uh, be accepting and supportive and who loves you and uh, or who really likes you, <laughs> whatever it is, but this kind of disgust reaction, rejection kind of response um, can be uh, particularly biting, particularly um, uh, hurtful uh, to get it from uh, a more intimate partner. And so a lot of people keep their raunch play in the closet because they are expecting to have this sort of disgust, rejection kind of response. Um, and I had a number of people, right, contact me as I was preparing this to basically say how much they don't share, that they're really into some of these uh, types of raunch play uh, until they really get to know someone. So they don't flag it, they don't advertise it, they don't in any way um, kind of send out a more public signal that they're into it until they really get to know someone. And then they might share. And even then, uh, it may take them a really long time. So there are a lot of people who are in the closet when it comes to ranch play. And uh, that's happening even among, right, gay leathermen. So my final message, really, <clears throat> keep calm and enjoy your sexuality. Um, it's probably the best attitude to have <laughs> rather than all of the kink shaming. Uh, so what I'd like to do is uh, to really um, kind of open it up and to see what people want to share or want to say um, about this. Um, Jay, how much time do you want to save for the wrapping up part? Um, let's go, let's plan to go till 930 or so. So um, okay. if folks have actual, if folks have questions and want to um, be unmuted, and ask your question in person, please uh, just use the raise hand feature. Yeah. Feel free to also type anything into the chat and we will um, pass it on. Okay. Let me say, Richard, while folks are deciding what they want to say or not, uh, thank you so much for your presentation today was fascinating and in um, and as you saw in the chat, people were really engaged. So um, it was really terrific. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank you, Richard. Yeah. Thank you. I'm gonna chime in too and say that uh, since he didn't plug it, I'm gonna plug uh, his book, Sexual Outsiders, uh, that he did with David Ortman. Uh, for me, that was uh, that was one of the more eye-opening um, books talking about things that I had not necessarily tried or, or were interested in that gave me a really strong idea of, of why other people would be into those things in a really um, uh, impactful way. So if, if some of these sorts of things are not, you know, not really clicking for you or if, or if even talking about it tonight hasn't been interesting, but you, but you want to learn more about these things, I would highly recommend his book, Sexual Outsiders. Uh, in particular, uh, <laughs> page page one hundred uh, is is a place where we did it. Uh, David and Orton, Ortman and I really talked a lot about whether or not we should even touch on this particular kind of raunch play. Uh, that starting on page one hundred is a story, a case of someone really uh, into um, uh, getting into uh, in the context of their relationship uh, piss and scat. And uh, we tried to really, uh, thank you, Eric, because we really tried to get across like, what's the motivation? Just don't, get, don't get stuck on what's happening. 
you know, let's really try to understand why, why would someone really want to do this? So um, we presented that case and uh, we've had some, uh, we really debated whether or not we should include it. Um, and in fact, um, I've gotten a couple over the years of um, professional colleagues who just thought that thing starting on page 100 uh, should not have been in there that it was terrible to bring that up, that I was, you know, uh, by us talking about this as part of kink, we were ruining it, you know, tr ruining the chance that people would accept kink uh, by including it. But David and I went back and forth quite a lot going, it, it's really difficult to, to say, right? Um, we want to be sex positive. We really want to recognize the full range of human sexuality. The kink umbrella is amazingly large. How can we not talk about this? You know, at least a little bit. And so um, that was a that was probably one of the the places where we really went back and forth for a long time, and they just decided to do it. Now we've heard some people um, uh, just you know, often say, well, I got to that part and I found it a little disgusting and just went on uh, as well. Um, so I hope that some people though, found that it um, had more of the experience you had, Eric, about like, oh, I think I kind of get it now, at least in some way. On, on this note, Richard, we just had a question, like what do you think, how do you think that research can help um, decrease stigmas in this sort of stuff. So you talked about it in your book um, and you clearly are in the world of kink research. So, um, you know, how can research help with the stigma and taboos around this? Well, um, there's a couple of things, right, that we try to do. Uh, one is we try to, um, by talking about it in a way that's not um, shaming it uh, or sensationalizing it, we're trying to say, hey, there's a way to recognize and talk about ranch play or any kind of kink or, or fetish um, in a way that um, is respectful and, um, and, and to just treat it like, like it is uh, just one part of human sexuality. Uh, normal, healthy human sexuality. Um, the other part, of course, is to um, uh, really address some of the structural issues like, you know, um, why are the paraphilias still in the DSM and used primarily, as it turns out, uh, in legal and criminal proceedings and not necessarily in psychiatric care, but it's there causing all sorts of trouble. And that leads to a lot of, um, you know, it perpetuates and intensifies the stigma. So, um, I mean, things have certainly improved a lot. Um, again, I cite the, the, the DSM project, uh, Ray Spannon and uh, NCSF have done quite a lot to make things better there. And we want to, you know, in Tashra and in Karis, we try to um, make that better uh, by getting like good information, um, empirically based information uh, into the literature, into the bloodstream in essence of clinical care and science. So it's good that it's there that will help like in long term. Um, so between normalizing and really trying to make uh, our healthcare system better in terms of how it treats kinky people. Those are some ways. Uh, there are lots of other areas that we don't touch, you know, legal, public policy, whole host of things. But um, I, I think it helps to have that stuff because in some ways, if an authority figure says, oh, this is just a normal aspect of human sexuality, and not something that is sick or disordered or diseased, um, it can at least cause some people, right, 
to really um, uh, question their assumptions or the way that they've been taught. Um, at the same time, I think uh, changing people's attitudes around, I don't know, like raunch play or something, also requires a much bigger project. And that is um, having to address uh, sex negative, sort of just people who are just negative about sex in general, all kinds of sex. Um, and that's probably like the biggest issue is the more that we can create a sex positive culture, the better off kinky people are gonna be, right? And, and that probably is like the biggest uh, factor. I've seen a couple of studies which basically found that a person's general sex positivity or sex negativity kind of determines their attitudes about kink and about fetish. And those things can be very difficult to change um, unless we have a more concerted effort to actually create uh, messaging that, you know, sex in and of itself is a good human thing. Uh, and then we can talk about kink and raunch. I think that's a great, great way to wrap that up for tonight. That's perfect, Richard. Because um, I did want to take some, a little bit of time before we lose everybody to give you a chance to respond to one question, burning question, which is what's happening with mentoring okay. and what are we doing at this point? Well, glad you asked. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'm, um, I'm gonna go ahead in the chat and put uh, a link to a sign up. This is what Eric, we're gonna be Eric doing. Eric just put it in actually. He did. All yeah. right. Let me put it in again. Okay. Um, so in trying to figure out, right, I mean, one of the things we learned last year, um, because the pandemic and the, the shutdown and all that other stuff happened um, very soon after we started, right, um, was uh, we were able to sort of maintain some sort of mentoring going on, but it was um, very difficult. It's very difficult to do the kind of stuff that we do online. Um, there are some things you can do, but so much of the mentoring aspect had to do with getting your hands on, right? Hands on something, uh, going to community events. Uh, and all, none of that stuff was really happening in any kind of way that was safe. So we tried uh, to kind of maintain it but it was a, it took a lot out of us in addition to all of us being affected by all of the issues and changes. Um, and we're not sure when we're gonna be able to get together again in large enough numbers to make it fun and safe. So what we've decided to do with the mentoring group is to spend the rest of this year uh, doing a, a reading group. Uh, we're gonna get together once a month and we're gonna read through two books, um, uh, Urban Aboriginals, and then um, Leather Folk, because these are two things written, you know, a fair, a while back, but who, uh, books that are actually pretty important, I think, for gay leathermen to know about. Um, and so we're going to read these two books. We're going to meet uh, once a month for about an hour and a half or so, uh, break up into small breakout rooms on Zoom and really discuss uh, some of the things that we're reading. And the idea is that we're going to do these two books and have this sort of reading group between now and the beginning of December. And then hopefully by then, right, um, come January, end of January, in 2022, we can start up again the way that we have been doing the mentoring program, which is getting together, getting more hands-on, maybe more community events happening. And uh, that becomes then the focus of the mentoring. So, um, so we're gonna do a book club instead of a regular mentoring program this year. And these two uh, readings um, of books, I think, um, 
any new, you know, or not even new, uh, any gay leather man should uh, at least be aware of some of the um, ideas and uh, stories and uh, information in, in these two books. So um, there's a sign up sheet. We're going to have an organizing meeting on April 10th. Um, and uh, we'll see like yeah, how small, how big a group it is that wants to do this kind of activity. Um, it seems to be something that's uh, much better to sustain and support um, in the context of Zoom and online meetings than uh, trying to do the usual stuff that we do for the mentoring program. So that's what we're gonna be doing um, this year. And I believe we'll send out some emails soon. There's, uh, uh, there's a page on the website already. Um, and if people uh, sign up, um, I'll send out the Zoom link uh, for the April 10th. And uh, uh, that's how we'll sort of stay connected, engaged and still learning and developing our kinky identities. Um, that's terrific. And it's open, it's, it's not, you know, the mentoring program really is designed for people who are relatively new to kink, right? Or new to the community or who have just moved here from someplace else. Um, I really think the book club thing is really meant for anybody and everybody who wants to do something like this. Great. Well, I, I for one, am excited about it. I think it's a great idea and um, already seeing some positive responses in the chat. So that's wonderful. On that note, um, we're gonna go ahead and close out for the evening. Thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Um, at the height, we had about 90 people on the call tonight. Wow. So another successful, wonderful group. Um, uh, Miguel, the suggested donation is for Tashra. Um, there's a link at the beginning of the uh, chat if you um, scroll up. Um, and we really appreciate folks coming in. So uh, thank you so much, everybody. And we will look forward to seeing you all next month for the Leather Archives and Museum and talk about uh, our history and look at some cool art of our history as well. So we will see you all then.